Some lifting bros like bashing lifting science, appealing to strawman arguments about you don't need to overthink it, just lift or these studies are stupid and don't apply to me, alongside with other BS that never fully makes sense. But now that I'm officially 30 and I have been lifting for 13 plus years, I can finally say back in my day with the confidence and patronizing energy that this statement deserves. Back in my day, aka circa 2012, we were not blessed with the constant stream of lifting research and content that many young lifters have at the moment. We couldn't complain about the 20th, 15 minute high production value educational video by Milo Wolf or why Jeff Nippert released another video on the latest lifting science. Instead, we relied on that one study that wasn't done with lifters in mind or the latest blog post article by certain individuals or even those webcam recorded over Skype debates and educational videos. That total volume is now going to be much lower. The MRV for MacroCycle is, did you fully recover to have another great year of training? Other times we just simply watched Hodge twins swear by intermittent fasting and people claiming that all you need for maximum growth are big compound lifts, whatever that. Title this email, What's the easiest way to intermittent fast? That's a good email. However, as time passed, more and more research came out that completely changed how many of us view muscle growth training. The irony though, with science and lifting, is that not only has science been going against the notion of overthinking by showing you how flexible you can be with your training, but it has arguably been much more relaxed than many bro dogmas and ultra specific methods. Starting off with a strength and endurance continuum, AKA the strength and hypertrophy repetition ranges that should be followed to a T if you want to maximize any of those adaptations. Low reps for strength, moderate reps for muscle growth and higher reps for endurance. That was the thinking back then. If you did anything less than eight to 12 repetitions, you were doing strength. If you did anything more than 12, you were doing endurance and you had to be in that eight to 12 repetition range to maximize muscle growth. Although some of that is somewhat true, uh, especially for strength and endurance, science has shown us that when it comes to hypertrophy, similar gains can be achieved with a plethora of repetition ranges as long as you're lifting a weight above 30% of your one repetition maximum and you're training close to failure. For strength, science still supports the notion that heavier loads are better for maximal strength without that meaning that moderate loads can also lead to substantial strength increases. As far as endurance goes, science has shown us that for relative muscle endurance, higher reps with light loads are likely best, but getting stronger can improve your absolute endurance substantially. For example, if you go from bench pressing 200 pounds for one rep to 250 pounds to one rep, your relative muscle endurance at 60% of your one repetition maximum strength is likely not going to change by much, but you're likely going to be able to press a lighter weight for more reps than you could back when your strength was lower. Shocking, right? Anyways, the point here was muscle growth and the myth of eight to 12 reps being ideal for hypertrophy, when in reality, even sets of three to five reps close to failure will massively contribute to your future muscle gains. When I came up, the idea of a specific optimal rep range for hypertrophy was something you would always hear about, making lifting less flexible for a lot of us, while creating more questions and confusion as to the why behind the hypertrophy rep range. This was especially true if you were also interested in strength training. Now, you know that as long as you're close to failure, good things will happen. I personally enjoy staying in the five to 10 rep range for most things, and I push most of my sets to failure as based on the current literature and my own experience, higher rep sets become a bit more difficult from a knowing how close to failure you are standpoint. Plus, I like lifting heavy stuff, and I like being done with my set relatively quickly instead of being there and doing reps on reps on reps. Moving on to another area of research that has changed and may substantially change how we lift. Range of motion. Yes, the stretch cult, as people call us these days, seems like it's here to stay. The insane, unfathomable recommendation of emphasizing the stretch when you're performing an exercise or performing partial reps 
at the stretch part of an exercise has people coping and seething harder than when that 52 said. Yes, people are mad at being told, hey, seems like including that lengthened position is good for muscle growth. Don't skip it if you want maximum gains. Even though Arnold literally said the exact same thing in the classic, but not so great, Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding 30 or so years ago. But the stretch cult is bad for this insane and time-consuming recommendation sprinkled with disclaimers and mostly presented in the context of maximizing muscle growth. The cult sincerely apologizes for the extra 0.5 to 1 seconds you spend at the bottom of a squat or at the top of a lat fulldown. We hope you forgive us. Joking aside though, the past few years, more and more research has been showing that training at longer muscle lengths results in more growth than training at short muscle lengths. And it has also been showing that training with a full range of motion, at least as it stands, is either as good or slightly worse than performing lengthened partials, with the former likely being more true when the stretch is emphasized. The issue people take with this is that they think that they have to get in some weird position or stretch to the point of insane discomfort when it's likely that they're maximizing gains, just making sure to include long muscle lengths and by performing a variety of exercises. It's really not much of a shocking recommendation or anything that you weren't already doing if you were doing mostly a full range of motion. Our recent study in trained lifters showed that a full range of motion with stretch emphasis was as good as doing half reps at the lengthened position for muscle growth and strength, further highlighting the potential importance of just including the stretch when you lift, but also showing that, hey, you can be pretty flexible with your range of motion as long as you take care of that. I personally think that that's really cool and can be cool to many of us lifters, regardless of whether they care about maximizing muscle growth or not. Overall though, the range of motion research has changed the way many of us lift with definitely more to discover in the next few years, which I'm definitely hyped for. Another area of research that has changed the way we lift is the volume research. No. This is not yet another shield for big volume. Well, at least not fully. Science has not only shown us that, hey, if you want to make the most educated bet at growing a given muscle group, doing a bit more volume than you're currently doing may do the trick, but it has also shown us that, hey, don't worry though, even a few hard sets per week will lead to substantial gains. Yes, I can see you typing. We knew that already. But we didn't. Especially back in the day, the camps of low versus high volume each argued that their method is ideal for growth, leaving many confused as to how much to do, often overthinking their training and assuming that they're either under or overdoing it with volume. There are people out there that literally think they will lose muscle if they only do a handful of hard sets per week, while others fear that they will suddenly overtrain and lose gains if they do more than 20 sets per week. The reality, as it stands, is that 10 to 20 sets per muscle group would get you a lot of gains, perhaps close to 90% of potential muscle gains, with volumes as low as a single set performed a few times per week per muscle group being enough to give you significant muscle growth. However, if let's say you really want your arms to grow as much as possible and you're recovering fine from doing 10 to 20 sets, doing 30 plus sets can potentially give you that extra bit of muscle that you want. Regardless though, you can feel confident that you're making amazing gains with 10 to 20 direct sets per muscle group per week. And you can also feel confident that you're still making some gains even when going as low as three to five sets per muscle group per week. That's pretty cool in my opinion. Another way science has completely changed the way we live in terms of conditions apply is the tempo research. We covered quite a bit of that in our narrative review on optimizing technique for muscle growth, but overall, the idea that time under tension or super explosive reps on the other side are best for muscle growth is somewhat BS. As it stands, science is again showing us that we can be super flexible with our concentric and eccentric repetition tempo, and that as long as your entire repetition duration is somewhere in the two to eight seconds range, whether you slow down the eccentric by a lot or the concentric, it doesn't seem to matter that much. I personally think that somewhat controlling the eccentric versus letting the weight free fall is good practice and probably a good idea for maximizing muscle growth, but I'd be confident to say that even if you didn't control it at all, you'd still make solid gains, especially if you trained close to failure and your entire repetition duration 
or somewhere in the two to eight seconds. But what is a great way to take all the science that has somewhat changed the way we live and implement it in your own programming, you ask Dr. Pack. And I'm here to tell you that thankfully, our upcoming app MyAdap has you covered. Informed by the latest scientific evidence and constantly updated to include any scientific updates that make sense. For example, if the tempo research in three years completely changes, the recommendations of the app will change with it. And similarly, if the range of motion recommendations change in a few years, the app will adapt to that as well. MyAdapt will create any sort of program you like from the most obscure training program that you can come up with where you wanna train your upper traps and specialize on quads and only train two times per week to your typical pro split, your typical push, pull, leg split, or whatever else your crazy mind comes up with. The good thing is that MyAdapt has been designed not only by pencil neck sports scientists, but also experienced coaches and lifters themselves taking a fully evidence-based approach at designing an app that the market has never seen before. Express interest now at myadapt.com and be the first to know when the app is coming out. When it launches, you obviously get a free week trial to try the app and that will be in place likely forever. So you can play around with it, see what it generates, and then you can continue using it if you'd like to. This is not a gimmick, this is not an app with pre-made templates or a fancy workout tracker. This is the real deal. We expect it to launch somewhere in the next two to three months. It's been three years in the making and we're super excited to share it with you. MyAdapt.com, shameless plug, because it's a solid product. I wouldn't be plugging it if I didn't believe it. Dab on them. From these few areas of research where sports science, IMO, has changed the way our, we lift, there is an area of research that may cause a substantial upcoming flip-flop and may completely change the way we lift. And this is no gimmick or clickbaity bullshit. And that area of research is looking at whether isometric repetitions, especially at long muscle lengths, can lead to substantial muscle growth and how that compares with isotonic repetitions that include a concentric and eccentric action. As it stands, and the answer may shock you, we don't have much on this area of research. Yes, the idea of including both a concentric and eccentric action makes sense as it stands, but you never know. It may be that if you perform isometric repetitions along muscle lengths, you don't need to actually do the lifting itself. Again, not much on the topic at the moment. We are working on a proof of concept study uh, which should be out in the next few months. But based on the findings of that study, which will act as a base for future research, in a few years, lifting may completely change. Lifting may completely change. And there you have it. A bunch of ways science changed the way we lift and a potential upset in gyms across the world. We shall see. We'll keep you posted as always. Social media PhDs, you know the deal. We do research for free and work six jobs at a time so that you can hate on those stupid new studies that are coming out. Other than that, I am not wearing rascal apparel today. I apologize to our boss and overlord Omar Isuf, but if you like rascal apparel, which I wear like 99% of the time at this point, check out rascalapparel.com or rascalapparel.eu with code Dr. Pack to get your own rascal drip and 10% off with that code. And I'll see all of you guys, my rascals, next time. Free Omar Isuf. Free. That's how you load a gun, by the way. <laughs>